Hello everybody and welcome to Chess24 and welcome to my game of the day for the Tata Steel Chess Masters section featuring some of the world's best players including world champion Magnus Carlsen, Sergei Karyakin, world championship challenger amongst many other elite players. The penultimate round happened today and the tournament situation was that Wesley So was out in front having a brilliant tournament and really continuing in the same vein as he did towards the end of 2016, uh, winning and converting the positions he should and not losing over 50 games unbeaten um, and had one big uh, moment earlier on in the tournament against Rickard Rapport that he managed to weather. Um, that's not what I'm going to look at today, actually, the Wesley So game. He actually played against Wei Yi, and uh, Wei Yi was the guy clipping at his heels, the young Chinese prodigy. But uh, Wesley with the white pieces made sure that he took no risks and the game ended in a draw. So the big question was, well, can anybody else catch Wesley So in this tournament? So I'm going to choose the game Eldjanov versus Carlsen to look at today. We're going to see what happens. Magnus Carlsen, world champion. Pavel Eldjanov having a good tournament. If one of these guys were to win, well, then they would have a an outside chance at uh, overtaking Wesley uh, with one game to go. So let's see what happened. Pavel Elyanov with the white pieces. And just before we look at the game, we can see there with the head-to-head, -head, Pavel Elyanov actually has got a 0% score against Magnus Carlsen prior to this game. So, finding it very difficult to play Magnus. And today, well, I feel like he should have a renewed sense of optimism. He's been playing pretty well in the tournament, and Magnus has been playing below par. So, let's see if that made a difference. Well, the game started d4, e6, c4, and now Magnus chooses the move f5, the Dutch defence. Of course, Magnus has played these positions many, many times. But today, the Dutch defence was a clear indication that he wanted to um, create a very imbalanced game and go for a very complicated position. Leonard played g3, knight of six, bishop g2. And now, in this position, there are two main ways you can play Dutches. You can play with the bishop on e7 and castle short or you can do what Magnus did and play the move d5 entering the so-called stone wall structure of the Dutch defense actually a lot of players play c6 first here preparing d5 Magnus played d5 anyway and now in this position Elianov played the very classical move knight f3 there is an argument for the move knight h3 because after, let's say, c6, castles, bishop d6, White's idea is that perhaps he wants to go bishop f4 and trade these two bishops, trading black's uh, good bishop for uh, White's bishop and, of course, leaving himself with a bishop on c8, which sometimes has difficulties finding work. But Elianov just decides, you know what, I'll just play something standard, knight f3, bishop d6, Knight c3 and c6. So we've got a very classical uh, position. And now Elianov plays what seems to be not a new trend or a new move, but the way a lot of players are playing. Now he just plays bishop f4 straight off the bat and says, you know what? I don't mind if you double my pawns here because I'm going to have fantastic control of the e5 e5 square, I should say, and a slight space advantage. Castles e3 happened, and we get a very um, standard uh, position for the Stonewall defense, where Black has got one big problem he has to resolve, and that's that bishop on c8. If he manages to do that via either getting it out this way, sometimes getting it out this way, then he'll be fine because he's got a very solid structure. Um, and what's also very important about this position is that 
Though this bishop on g2 is on paper a good bishop because the pawns around it are all on dark squares, so it theoretically has room to roam, actually in practice this bishop is not that much better than this bishop because it is just staring at the stone wall on d5. So what I like to say is this is uh, what I like to call a bad good bishop and this is actually potentially a good bad bishop because after Magnus's next move though all of its uh, pawns are on the same color square as that bishop it might find work. But bishop d7 already feels a bit weird to me. It feels a bit slow and now I like Pavel's next move queen b3. Just asking a question how are you going to defend that pawn? Well Carlsen played queen c7 and Elianov castled, bishop e8, and rook fc1. And during the live commentary, the more this game continued, the more I felt like Elianov just had a brilliant position. He's got a fantastic outpost for his knight on e5. He's immediately threatening, let's say, Magnus Woods play a move like knight bd7. This is a standard tactic in the position. The queen is on prees. So you have to do something. So Magnus wasted another move here, queen e7. And now we reach a really interesting moment where a lot of players, myself included, would perhaps just play the move knight e5. Because again, knight bd7 is impossible due to queen takes b7. And here it's actually very difficult for black to make a decent move or have a decent plan. If b6 ever happens, we can just take on d5. And if ed5, we've got the beautiful little tactic. Knight takes d5. <clears throat> the point being takes, 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 and now takes. And I win the rook in the corner. So, like, after knight e5, it's clear that Magnus's opening approach, moves like bishop d7, queen c7, just weren't uh, accurate enough. And I feel like white is somewhat better here. But instead, Elyanov decided to play the very interesting strategic idea, queen a3. I wasn't a big fan of this during the commentary, but I still think it's a perfectly fine move. It relieves black's position a bit, but his idea, and this move is seen in a lot of positions, is that despite allowing the doubling of pawns, he opens up the b-file, and it's always very difficult for Magnus to protect this b7 or b6 pawn, depending where it lands, because eventually white can use these a pawns as battering rams. So knight bd7, rook a b1, rook b8, and now I like Elyanov's move, pawn to a4. He wants to gain space with a5 and eventually double on the b line, putting maximum pressure on b7, whilst again, coordination in black's position isn't quite there. Magnus played a5, which is a good attempt because it fixes these pawns, but at the same time, now, when you move this B pawn, you have no protection from an A pawn. So Rook B2 was played, excellent move. And Pavel just wants to, to uh, double on the B line. Knight E4 was played by Magnus, uh, Pavel took. And now he played, again, a perfectly fine move here. He played the move Knight to G5. Knight E5 was also worthy of consideration but perhaps he didn't like the idea that Magnus could go c5 here, and this bishop does have some purpose, but even this uh, might not be good enough for black to uh, gain full equality. But knight g5 is, is an excellent move because it hits e6, meaning that Magnus has to take a time out to protect the pawn, rook f6, and now Pavel played another very strong move, f3. This is the idea. He wants to make sure that this uh, diagonal is open for the bishop h6, knight h3, kicking the knight back before taking on f3. And if we take stock here, it's absolutely clear that Magnus is in a really, really difficult position. Uh, he's got a weakness here. His rook is misplaced here. He's got a poorly placed bishop. He's got potential weaknesses here. And Pavel just needs to make sure his knight comes into the fray again, like so, and he's going to be much better or even positionally winning. So after rook f7, in this position I thought that there were a few interesting ideas. The move rook cb1 might just be crushing because 
if knight f6 and now knight f2, um, white is just going knight d3, knight c5. Uh, and this looks very unpleasant. Maybe black has to go c5, like he does in many variations. But even after d takes c5, if you take on a4, just c6. And we see problems with this uh, configuration. So I think rook cb1 was definitely worthy of configuration. I think white is close to winning here. Um, also, the move c5, I think, is worthy of attention to stop any c5 breaks by black, yes, you give up the d5 square, but the point is, let's say knight f6, knight f2, and let's say knight d5. After just taking, we actually get a position where, um, let's say something like this, even though white gives up the pawn on a4, when he eventually goes either rook takes e6, he can go rook here first, the knight lands, we get a typical position where the knight is an absolute monster on e5, c6 is in the air, just too much going on. So those were interesting options. The more I look at knight of two, the more I think, well, maybe this gave black just a sniff of hope because now Magnus played the move c5. And actually it's from this point where Magnus, after playing the first half of the game poorly for somebody of his standards, played like the true champion he is and started to play brilliant chess. We'll see what happened. C5 was played, so the idea obviously is that d takes c5 is a terrible move because knight takes c5. We leave ourselves with tremendous weaknesses and a fantastic outpost for this knight. This would actually already be much better for black. So Pavel's idea was to go knight d3, forcing cd4, ed4, and now he wanted to go knight f6, um, protecting the b-pawn. Karls uh, Elianov played knight c5. And now the, another excellent move by Magnus Carlsen, knight to e4. He has to drum up some active counterplay somehow. The point of this is, of course, if you take everything off, black will take on f4, and there's a lot of pawns to be eaten up along the fourth rank. So Elianov took on e6, and Magnus took on a4. So material uh, is still even. And now Elianov played d5. Um, Definitely a very sensible move. But now Carlson found again another only move, bishop d7. And it was here where I think Pavel made his first serious mistake of the game. He played the move bishop takes e4. I think instead he should have considered the move c5 in this position with the idea that if bishop takes knight, which looks like the first move you look at, pawn takes bishop, and now move like rook c7. After bishop takes f e4, f takes e4, and now a move like king to f2, there's a good chance that this rook ending is extremely unpleasant for Carlsen. The point being that I can put a rook on b6, a king on e3, play f5 if I need to, and I'm just too active. And my gut feeling is that this is probably close to losing. For Magnus. So it would have been interesting to see how he would have reacted to c5. Perhaps he can play moves like rook c8, but these are really difficult to see, allowing rook takes b7s in some positions, obviously not here. Bishop h5 is in the air. There's just a lot of moves here which are just very difficult for Magnus to play. But this move by Pavel was really bad because after fe4, knight c5, bishop g4 was played. And the bishop now has found a new lease of life. And after, let's say, knight takes e4, rook takes f4, you know, this whole transformation has been clearly beneficial for black, where suddenly it's white's king out of nowhere, which can feel a bit in danger. In fact, we'll see that in the game. Because after bishop g4, rook e1, rook c8 was an excellent move. Knight takes e4, rook takes f4. The knight came to d6 and rook c f8. Actually, <laughs> suddenly there are all kinds of combos where the white king walks into a massive attack. So the pendulum had truly swung by this point. Eliana played the move rook b3 because 
he wanted to meet the move. Uh, he wanted to stop bishop h3 and rook f1 ideas, but he also wanted to meet the move bishop f3 with the cute move h3, giving his king some potential luft and a haven on g3. But Magnus was not to be so uh, accommodating, played the move rook a f6, and after knight e4, played rook g6, threatening some monster discovered attack. So Pavel blocked this, but this now allowed the move b6. And it's absolutely obvious how the transformation of this position has been beneficial for Magnus. He's now not got this awkward backward pawn. These pawns have also been stopped in their tracks, and they were always potentially threatening to walk up the board like space invaders. And here, I think Pavel had to find the move h3. Forcing an exchange of rooks and playing like so, and even after bishop d3 here, check king h7 and rook c8. The position is still very unbalanced and quite unclear. Maybe even black is pref for preference, but white would at least keep his pawns, and I think the most likely result is this, this, there is somehow some kind of transformation to an equal ending. White can always go c5 as well. So I think the most likely result in this position was a draw, but Pavel played d6, which was a blunder. Because now after the move king h7, um, protecting this rook, d7 is no longer a threat because I can just take it. And this pawn suddenly becomes a weakness, not a strength. In fact, Pavel realized this, he played knight f2, but perhaps he miscalculated because after rook takes pawn here, I think after knight takes g4, he wanted the move rook c takes g4, but this actually just loses to rook d1. And if you take check here, just king f2, and there's no way to actually get back and block this pawn. But after rook gg takes e4, it was absolutely clear that this had been going horribly wrong for Pavel, who was now a pawn down. And after rook d1, the same trick doesn't work because of rook c to d4. And uh, there's no way for, for white to keep hold of the d6 pawn. So Pavel tried rook g4, rook g4, king f2, rook d4, and rook e6. And they'd made the time control by now, but very quick count. Magnus has won a pawn from this position, and white's rook is passive. Carlson played king g8, king e3, rook d1. And now with king f7 coming, Elianov thought there was nothing better than to play the move pawn to d7. With the idea that after takes, takes. And we reached this position. Now, when we first looked at this position, and when you first analyze this even with engines, the engines don't give much here for black. But actually, Magnus Carlsen made this look so, so straightforward to play this ending. The problem White has is that he's got two weaknesses. And if it were to White to move here, actually, I think this would be very close to a draw, because he could play the move rook to b5 and force the black rook to be passive. But just like in many rook endings, it is absolutely crucial for you, either as attacking defender or as a defending player, to be the first one to get your rook active. And Magnus played an excellent move. He played the move rook to d5. The reason why this is an excellent move is he wants to go rook to h5. And let's say rook a6 happened, rook h5, let's just say king f3, uh, takes and now takes, um, most of the time this ending is just winning for black. Two on one side versus one. And I'm not saying this is the exact most precise way, but in general this is uh, should be winning for black. So it was clear that Magnus wanted to take this pawn on, on, B, uh, on h2, so Elianov had to go passive with his rook. King h7 played, king e4, and now rook h5. So what's stage two of this ending? Well, stage two of this ending is now Magnus actually wants to place his rook on the a3 square, where this would keep the b2 rook passive, and at the same time allow this king and pawns to start walking down the board. So king f4, rook h4 check, King g3, well he can go rook a4 here, but actually there's no need while the pawn isn't attacked. 
Why not advance to start off with g5? Great move. Pavel tried rook b7 check, king g6, rook b6 check, king h5. And the problem is, again, if Pavel goes passive, all Magnus is going to do is going to play the move rook a4. He's then going to give a check on a3, forcing the king passive here. And then let's just say, for example, rook c2, rook a3 check, king g2, and now king h4. Mag uh, Pavel just has to stay passive, rook b2. But after the move g4, rook c2, let's say h5, rook b2, and now a4. Black's winning plan is the following. He wants to go rook over, pawn down, and then he wants to come to b2. So, again, to illustrate this, rook d1 here. White can't leave the second because of rook d2 check. So let's say he goes here, but now quite simply rook b1. This is the key winning idea with the idea of going rook b2. And of course, the rook exchange would just be immediate resignation. So believe it or not, around this position here, despite being only a pawn up in a rook ending, it feels like it's completely winning given the passiv passivity of the white rook. Pavel tried h3, and after rook a4, here again, Pavel decided passive defense wasn't sufficient. So he played the move rook to c6. Interesting idea, giving up the pawn. Rook b2, rook a3 check, king g2, king h4 would lead to pretty much the same kind of variations we just saw. So instead Pavel tried rook c6, rook a3 check, king g2, take the pawn with check, accurate, king g3, and now a4. Rook a6 and now a3. And what's very important to point out here, ladies and gentlemen, as Jan said a number of times during the commentary, is that you can blow this with black if, for example, after king f3, you decide to push your pawn to a2. This is not the way to win this position. This is actually the way to completely bungle this. Because despite what your engine says uh, here, this position here is a draw. It's a draw because the h pawn can't kick the king away from h2. So ideas like, just to illustrate, um, ideas like uh, king f2, which is always a bad idea, allowing rook h1. This is the key motif meaning that takes rook h2 check, would be winning a rook. So apart from that, the problem is here, black has got no shelter for his king, and there's no way he can make progress. So you can just give lateral checks till the cows come home, and now you go round the back. And once again, there's no shelter for the black king. As soon as it gets close, you just start to give checks. And you check fraternity. You can even check again here. You check, and if he goes here, no problem at all. Rook anywhere, and it's just a draw. So it's very important, ladies and gentlemen, for you guys to know that particular ending, that by pushing the a pawn too quickly, you risk everything. So here, instead of that, Magnus actually came up with a genius, very nice solution. He played the move rook to b2. The point being that if rook takes a3, black can now go king h4, and actually there's no way to save this a pawn, h pawn. White can try rook a6, hoping for king takes h3, rook takes h6 mate, but not against world champion. The simple h5 would do the business, and there's no way to stop black collecting this pawn and of course two connected passes is a simple task. Pavel tried king g3, a2, king f3, cute little idea, but the easiest way actually is just to give up this pawn which Magnus played in a heartbeat because after rook takes a1 now the move king h4 is the same idea as before you're going to win the pawn on h3 and Pavel resigned. He had enough here. So, an absolutely 
incredible game where Magnus was, in my opinion, close to lost, if not lost, with further analysis. But just like we've seen Magnus Carlsen do time and time again, when his back is against the wall, um, he finds a way. He finds a way out of it. And not only does he sometimes hold positions, he actually ends up converting them, such as the psychological trauma for his opponent to deal with, you know, being in such a crushing position. And, you know, perhaps the head-to-head -head score had also played a big role in this. Elianov losing all classical games to Carlsen meant that he probably just thought at some point when it started really going downhill for him, today's just not going to be my day. This guy's going to be my nemesis forever. So um, a very important win for Magnus Carlsen. And despite having so many dodgy positions in this tournament, he now finds himself on seven and a half out of 11 and only half a point behind Wesley So with a round to go. Um, so the final round is going to be really interesting. Of course, odds are Wesley, given his recent form, is not going to lose that. So he's going to at least have eight and a half points. The big question is, is Magnus going to be able to do a Magnus style comeback? He plays Sergei Karyakin. What a final that is. A finale, uh, a repeat of his uh, match, World Championship match just a couple months ago against uh, Sergei. We'll see if he's got enough power to come through there. And we'll see how Wesley does as well. But for now, hope you enjoyed that analysis of Game of the Day uh, for round 12. And remember to tune in with me and Jan at 12 o'clock. So it's slightly earlier uh, kickoff time tomorrow, Central European time. But for now, it's Saturday night. Go out there, have some fun, have a nice dinner, have a nice sleep. Sleep's very important. And I'll see you all uh, during the commentary tomorrow.